This is Daniel Simon from Baton Rouge Community College. This is my podcast for the week. This is the Greek World History Podcast Part 3 on the rise of the Macedonians in the Hellenistic Age. Now, uh, before we had covered uh, the Greek world dealing with, um, last week we did Greco-Persian Wars. Uh, We also covered uh, up to like the Greek culture and... um, this week, of course, we'll be talking about the Macedonians and, of course, the rise of Alexander the Great. Now, um, a little background about, of course, the rise of, of Macedonia and all that. Macedonia, actually a kingdom, um, rose in the 4th century, and um, they became a major power at that time. And there were different reasons why Macedonia became a major power. Uh, one, of course, uh, was the... Um, fact that the Greek city-states had declined. This, of course, occurred around the Peloponnesian War. Athens wasn't a major power anymore by 404 BC. Also, the Persian Empire weakened as well, and so that allowed the Greeks and the Macedonians an easy way to conquer them. And you had the leadership of uh, King Philip II uh, and his son Alexander the Great. That was, of course, the other reason uh, for why it happened as well. So it's kind of a combination of those, like, causes and reasons of why, um, you know, the Macedonian period followed with the Hellenistic Age. Let's talk about the background of Macedonia, a little geography. Uh, The Macedonians are Greek peoples, uh, just like a lot of the other Greeks in the south. However, uh, they were kind of seen as um, barbarians. Uh, They lived in uh, kind of north of the mainland of Greece in what is the Balkans area, now called Macedon or Macedonia. Uh, Actually, the real name is Macedon. They actually pronounce it. And I think later and over time became known as Macedon. I kind of slurred it and became Macedon. And they're kind of like between Thrace and where Macedon is now in northern Greece. Uh, They lived in the Pindus Mountains. And yeah, like I said, they were kind of seen as different from the other Greeks that were more to the south saw them as barbarians, and anybody that spoke kind of a different accent or whatever was sometimes called a barbarian uh, and all that, but uh, the Macedonians were self-sufficient uh, with their economy, but they were more known for their military uh, overall, which was one of the most efficient at that time that rivaled, you know, like the Spartans to the south. Uh, this became more evident under King Philip II, who was one of their main kings who lived mostly in the main part of the uh, mid fourth century. Uh, let's talk about Philip II, also called Philip of Macedon. Now, Philip um, came to power around 359 BC. Um, he was, of course, kind of this um, brutish warrior type king uh, who uh, lost an eye in battle. And um, he was only in his early 20s when he came to the throne. And uh, Philip was known uh, for developing the Macedonian military, uh, which, like I said, would be one of the superior at the time uh, in all of Greece. And the Macedonian military was um, divided up into two main sections that was the most important. Uh, They had the um, so-called foot companions, which the the, uh, Macedonians were known for using pike phalanx, which were um, hoplite infantry and phalanx formations. Uh, that used a long spear or pike, which was about 18 feet long. And um, the Greeks called it a sarissa, was the nickname they called it. Um, They would usually put that in the center of their armies, and it was used as kind of a defensive uh, weapon uh, against enemy cavalry or infantry that would attack them in the center. And on their wings, usually on the left or right, uh, they would use cavalry, such as the Companion Cavalry. Uh, the Companion Cavalry was a famous Macedonian cavalry, which was mostly composed of, like, nobility. Uh, I think maybe, like, up to 3,000 may have been in it the most. And um, it's one of the, the most famous cavalries in probably ancient times. And they used it as an offensive weapon in battle, you know, usually trying to probe the enemy's flanks and uh, try to break through and, and destroy an army. And Alexander uh, was, of course, reliant on a lot in a lot of his battles. Uh, also, um, 
Philip uh, was notorious for having a lot of wives. I think he had six or seven at one point. The Macedonians were kind of not exactly mon monogamous. And um, his main wife that was the most famous was Queen Olympias, uh, who was uh, Alexander's mother. She was actually from Epirus, which is now where I think Albania is, the west of uh, Macedonia. And um, she would have Alexander in 356 BC. That's when he'd be born. Uh, and she kind of doted on him and was kind of a big influence on Alexander later. Uh, she may have been the one that kind of put that thing in, you know, Alexander's head about being part God, you know, and all that. And um, there's a lot of legends, stories about um, Queen Olympias uh, and all that. Uh, but she was definitely an influence on Alexander, uh, not just, you know, Philip and others. Uh, Philip went on, uh, he eventually took over Greece uh, by about 338 B.C. Uh, he defeated the Greeks, like Thebes, I think, was one of the major powers in Greece at that time. He forced them to form an alliance with Macedonia, which was called the League of Corinth, I believe they called it. And uh, at that point, Alexander was even fighting under um, Philip's forces, even though he was really, really young at the time. He actually led some of the cavalry on some of the battles. And um, at that point, um, after Philip took over Greece, he was planning to take over Persia. Uh, but if you know what happened, he got assassinated. That's what happened. So that happened in 336 BC. Uh, Philip was killed. And um, there's a story where uh, he was at some kind of wedding banquet. Um, not him getting married, but I think one of his, I think his niece was getting married. One of his ex-bodyguards got up and stabbed him. Uh, with a nagger, and his bodyguards killed him before they could he could get away, and so uh, there was all kinds of stories circulating about you know who was really behind the the you know the the death of Philip, and um, Alexander himself believed the Persians were behind it, and, and that's partially why maybe Alexander invaded Persia to get revenge. But some claim that even the other thing that may have been was that uh, Queen Olympias may have actually killed Alexander and um, excuse me, killed, actually killed Philip to put Alexander on the throne. But I think they seem to think they don't really know. Uh, there's all kinds of speculation. There's even a speculation of a story I remember reading about where they think Pausanias may have been a jilted lover, you know, because of the fact that the Greeks were bisexual, if you know about that. And um, that's a third theory they had too as well. So they don't really know. Exactly who was behind it. Um, Alexander uh, then became king in 336 BC. He would reign about 12, 13 years, roughly. He reigned from 336 to 323. Uh, he's actually known by the uh, Greeks as Alexandros. Uh, of course, in the West, they say Alexander. Uh, the nickname, the Great, was a nickname later kind of adopted, I think, by Roman times uh, originally. And. Um, so no, he called him that in his lifetime, and um, so he, they think they think that um, he, I think it was like twelve years and eight months, maybe how long he was in power. Now there's different historians that write about Alexander. Uh, there's one named Plutarch who I'll mention. He's the most famous. Uh, he wrote a lot about Alexander. He had a biography on him called The Life of Alexander. He gives us a lot of background about uh, Alexander's life uh, in general, and. Um, what I've gotten, the notes I gave you, though that may be um, how Alexander looked. They have paintings of Alexander, like there's one back here I've got of Alexander, uh, which is the one they found in Pompeii, if you know about this. Um, it's picks of kind of dark hair, darker brown hair, basically. And I think in some movies he's got blonde hair, which I don't know about that. Uh, but there's a, some weird stories about Alexander. Uh, there's a weird story about his eyes, if you know about that. They say they were two different colors. Uh, there's some kind of eye disorder. Uh, they do think he was short, you know. Uh, he's not a very tall man. Um, maybe that's why he had that chip on his shoulder to want to conquer the world. Maybe like a Napoleon. So, yeah, and there's all kinds of other stories. Like um, Alexander also was um, obsessed with the Iliad, if you know about this. Um, the Iliad. And, um, yeah, um... You know about the story about that? He was tutored by Aristotle, which I mentioned before. And 
Aristotle gave him a um, personal copy of the Iliad. I think it was an annotated copy with notes in it. And um, Alexander was obsessed with Achilles. He thought he was Achilles. And I think sometimes I claim that sometimes he was like the new Achilles, wanting to conquer Persia, you know, like an Achilles. And um, so, yeah, he's, he's known for those kind of things as well, you know. And... Um, yeah, he was uh, claimed, they glad to think he was bisexual. Like, he had two wives. One, maybe I'll mention later, named Roxana, I think her name was, who was, a, I think, some kind of Persian princess he married. Uh, and then uh, he was known for having this uh, friend of his, who was a, also, I believe, a general under him, which was Ephesian. Ephesian was supposedly as one of his best friends that went back to his, when he was like a child. I think they were educated together with Aristotle. There's a claim that the two were lovers, you know, if you know about that. Uh, there's an old joke that used to say that the only thing that could tame uh, Alexander's heart uh, was, was the thighs of a feastion <laughs> or something like that. Um, so there's all kinds of stories about Alexander, and a lot of them are, you know, not really true. I think, so I think they, there's the Alexander romances later that they have in the medieval times and you got to wonder about half the stuff about Alexander, if it's really true or not. And the Greeks even thought he was like a god or part god. So uh, now, after uh, Alexander became, became king, king of Macedonia, uh, the Greek city-states rebelled to the south. So he had to actually go down there and overthrow them and take back power. So he had to subdue Thebes. It was one of the main city-states he actually um, subdued, uh, actually laid siege to him and crushed the city, like sacked it, except for a poet's house. It says, House of Pindar. He actually spared it. We like poetry. <laughs> and um, oh, he, took, he went to Athens and did it at Athens. And uh, at Athens, he was able to talk the uh, Greeks into fighting, you know, a war against Persia. Um, and um, it was a funny story about Alexander. When he was in, Alex, uh, um, he was in uh, Athens, he met this um, philosopher there you may have heard of. There was a story, story about Alexander and Diogenes. and he, what, Diogenes was a famous uh, philosopher at the time in Athens. And he came up to him and said, Diogenes, is there anything you need? And you know what he said? Get out of my sunlight. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, yeah, he gets, he gets the Greeks together, you know, to fight with his Macedonians. And they're going to, you know, take on Persia. And they're going to do basically what? you know, his father, Philip, you know, wasn't able to do. So, so Alexander amassed a force at that point. Um, I think it's like 30, 40,000 or more uh, troops he's got at that point. And so he marches towards um, Thrace, basically, and he crosses the Hellespont uh, and the Turkey at that point. And so they think about May of 334 B.C. is when they think that Alexander uh, invaded um, what is Persia into like Turkey or Western Asia Minor. The guy he fights against is a, is a king named Darius or Darius. So how they say it really. Uh, they might as well say Darius the Third. And Darius was in his mid to late forties, uh, roughly. Uh, he was only on the throne for a few years. He had just come to power, I believe, in three thirty six, which same year he came into power, Alexander. And um, at that time, the Persian Empire was declining. It wasn't the same empire it was originally. Uh, and so uh, Darius doesn't really think much of Alexander until later. So he crossed the, um, into Asia Minor at that point, and he fights his first battle against the Persian forces of Darius, which are mostly satrap forces that are in western Turkey. They fight a battle uh, that's called um, River Granicus, which we'll get to. Well, in a second. Now, let me first talk about, before we get to that battle, about the different historical works uh, that were written at the time. I just mentioned Plutarch. Plutarch's the most famous work uh, that was written on Alexander. It's called The Life of Alexander. That was written about mm, almost 2,000 years ago. Uh, there's also Curtius Rufus, is another one. Great wrote one called The History of Alexander the Great. He's a Roman writer, uh, where Plutarch is Greek. Also, Arian was another one. Arian of Nicomedia, they call him sometimes. Arian for short. We're at one called the Anabasis of, of um, Alexander. And um, you know, Anabasis means like a Greek word meaning like 
adventures or something like that. Adventures or conquests, probably maybe what it could mean too, I guess. But the Campaigns of Alexander is a common name they usually call it as well. So he's a Greek writer. Usually Arian and Plutarch are probably the most two famous, maybe the oldest. Now there's another one that's like one of the oldest that's older than that one, of those three, uh, is Diodorus of Sicily. He was a Greek writer writing in Roman times. And he wrote one called The Library of World History, which is like a basic life of, like a, like a biography or history of Alexander, um, which is kind of shorter. But it's actually the oldest. I think it goes back, I want to say, 1st century B.C. And there was other ones before that, but they don't exist anymore. So at the River Granicus uh, in May 30, 334 B.C., Alexander's forces fights against Darius satrap troops that are there, which have mercenaries of the the Greeks with him too. And um, Alexander's companion cavalry played a major role in that battle. Uh, it's called River Granicus because they fought kind of around a river which is in northwestern Turkey. His forces um, easily beat them, although they, there's a story where Alexander was, got killed in the battle. Uh, he got lucky. But his forces were able to eventually defeat, defeat the uh, Persian force. That became his first victory against the Persians. From there, he was able to seize the coastline of western Turkey, and a lot of the Greek city-states joined up with Alexander at that point. And he prevented the Persians from really resupplying their forces, and so uh, from there, he was able to push inward, eventually into, like, central Turkey or Asia Minor. I uh, did visit, like, Gordium, which is a famous city that was the capital of, you can see the kingdom of Phrygia at one point. Uh, there was this knot that was there that was tied up to an ox cart that had been left there, and there was a, a, a legend where uh, if you somehow untie the knot, you would be the king of Asia. And so what Alexander did to solve the riddle of that, took out his sword and he cut it. So he became the king of Asia. Uh, then Alexander kept pushing eastward towards Syria. And Darius at that point, Darius III, eventually brought up more forces. Uh, and that led to the Battle of Issus, which happened close to the beginning of November 333 B.C., uh, Darius the massive force against him that was larger than the previous one, 50, 60,000, although wasn't able to get all of his forces in because of a mountain that was nearby, or mountains nearby. And um, Alexander personally led his companion cavalry in the battle uh, of Issus. Uh, and um, his cavalry um, attacked what is Darius's left flank uh, in the battle. And um, as he attacked it and tried to break through, uh, which he would, uh, uh, um, Darius the Third um, panicked basically at that point, realized that he might lose the battle, maybe get captured, and so he fled, fled the battle basically, and uh, he left a lot of his stuff behind, including his, I think his mother was left behind, and a lot of his baggage, uh, his daughters too. Uh, Alexander captured them, and I think one of his daughters he ended up marrying later, believe it or not, and his, his, his own mother switched to Alexander's side and supported him instead. So with, with Issus being a, um, you know, Alexander victory, he then marched south in through Lebanon. Well, actually, Lebanon was harder than some of the other battles he fought. Uh, there was a city-state of Tyre, which was uh, where the coast of Lebanon is, they they want they didn't want to give up with a fight they want they didn't want to give it up and so he had to put up a fight with them, so he had to lay siege to them and when that wouldn't work he had to bring up siege towers and basically take the city, and um, it took him ten months to take Tyre I think it was which was his hardest really thing he had, that was probably his hardest battle maybe I think, um, from there he then pushed southward and then um, entered Egypt, uh, when he entered Egypt uh, the Egyptians basically declared him Pharaoh, and they were they were glad to get rid of uh, uh, the Persians. They hated the Persians because they had ruled over him like 200 years, and so he was declared Pharaoh at that point. And there's a weird story where Alexander um, um, Alexander had a horse that was real famous, uh, named Bucephalus, which is in that picture right there. Bucephalus uh, was this horse that is um, uh, uh, well, it was actually his father's horse originally, but he basically ended up buying it from him. And Bucephalus, uh, this horse he got when he was real young, like maybe a teenager, name means ox head. And um, supposedly he rode this horse all the way to Persia. One of the first famous horses in history. 
uh, Bucephalus. And uh, there's a story where he, uh, he and Bucephalus rode through the deserts of the Libyan desert uh, to like a, a place, um, I think it says in the, um, let me read the notes there. Um, he rode to uh, the uh, Sawa Oasis, it's called Sawa, S I W A H. And uh, it was where the oracle of Amon, um, Amon Ra was. Uh, and uh, he went to visit him, and uh, of course the um, oracle declared him, you know, Pharaoh, but also that he was part God, the son of Amon Ra, you know. And uh, there's a story where he told him some kind of prophecy. I don't, I don't know what it was. Basically, he said, "Oh, you're going to rule the world." You know, something I don't know exactly. Uh, but it's kind of a mystery. But at that point, you know, he's taken over Egypt. Um, now, when he's in Egypt, if you know about it, he then um, founds Alexandria, which is found on the Mediterranean coast on the western side of the Nile Delta. He starts building this Greek city there, the Greek model city. And, of course, everywhere Alexander went, uh, he would build all these little Alexandrias uh, from you know, Egypt to Turkey all the way to probably India. And uh, that city's important because it becomes like the... Um, um, center of Hellenistic culture. Uh, it influences a lot of people later as a whole. And he actually began designing the city, and the city would later have a famous library, the Library of Alexandria and all that. He's later buried there, too. Uh, they don't know where his tomb is, though. So, uh, at that point, Alexander's taken, like, the western half of, basically, of um, Darius's empire, and Darius, at that point, wanted to sue for peace. He actually sent ambassadors to Alexander, uh, who was thinking about invading uh, Mesopotamia at that point. And so um, Alexander had a meeting with his generals to decide what to do at that point. And uh, they, a lot of his generals wanted actually to give up on the war. And uh, one of the generals spoke up. His name was Parmenian. And Parmenian said, if I was Alexander, I would take this deal. Uh, and the deal was basically that uh, Darius III was going to give Alexander all of his lands to, I think, the Euphrates River. They could rat. You could have one of my daughters in marriage, you know, uh, stuff like that. Alexander speaks up and says, if I was Parmenian, I would. So Alexander decided he was going to go ahead and attack uh, Darius. He thought that he was in a better position and that Darius was, you know, um, you know weak than the Persian Empire, and he's just kicking over. So Alexander at that point then invaded uh, Mesopotamia, and he would end up fighting uh, Darius's forces um, in what is like eastern Iraq, close to the Iranian border, a place called Gagamela, it's called. Sometimes they call it Arabella, which may be sometimes a name they call it. And it, they, they, they took place in early October 331 B.C. Uh, Alexander's forces was heavily outnumbered. Uh, they say that uh, Darius's forces may have been like a quarter of a million at the most. And maybe Alexander had 50,000 uh, overall. And, um, and uh, Darius had even brought up these um, specialized chariots with these rotating skiffs on it. <laughs> It's ridiculous. They use those up in Roman times as well. I hope they give them too minute advantage uh, to maybe take out uh, some of his infantry and all that. And um, anyway, Darius' um, forces, um, they thought they pretty much had the win uh, easily. But uh, when um, the battle began, one of the things that Alexander did, of course, uh, was he attacked uh, Darius' uh, left flank. Uh, like, like he, like basically what he was going to do, uh, or what he did at Issus before, and uh, so uh, Darius responded by sending uh, his cavalry to to meet Alexander's cavalry, uh, and that proved to be kind of a mistake. Uh, and what happened was uh, Alexander basically uh, switched like ninety degree angle and attacked Darius's center with his companion cavalry. That scared the bejesus. <laughs> Scared the heck out of Darius, evidently. <laughs> he's like, oh no, he's coming for me again, uh, basically. And so guess what? Darius flees again, um, second time. Uh, and Alexander tries to go after him again, but gets away, you know. And so 
Darius III, he was just a cowardly, you know, commander of his forces. Uh, and Alexander was, had a tougher time with this battle than Issus, uh, but he was able to win it in the end. And then from there, Alexander then marched into Iran, like this heartland of, you know, the Persian Empire. He would seize their capital of Persia, which is Persepolis. Persepolis had been founded by Xerxes the Great. Long time. It was a great city, too, uh, Persepolis. And so at that point, Alexander claims himself as king of Persia. He's only 25 years old, really young, one of the youngest conquerors of all time. Uh, and he'll go on to conquer the rest of the Persian Empire after that. Uh, there's a story where Alexander got, I think you, if you know about the Macedonians, they were known for drinking heavily, like a lot of drinking, too much drinking. Uh, and uh, I think they say in a fit of drunken rage, he burned down Persepolis, just burned it down. Uh, they say the claim, the reason why he did it uh, was because it was revenge for the Persians, Persians burning Athens down. So he got, I guess he, that's part of why he attacked Persia, because he was mad about you know, the Persians attacking Greece, and he even wrote a letter to Darius. There's a, actually there's actually a letter that was found years later uh, that actually says that, that that's why he did it. Uh, what happened to Darius? Uh, Darius was actually killed by his own men. Yeah, <laughs> kind of crazy. Uh, but there was a, a Bactrian uh, a general, I think it was a cavalry general named Bessus, uh, that killed him um, in eastern Iran, I think where Bactria is. He was, I think uh, Bess wanted to take over the empire or something like that. He killed him to try to seize the throne. Alexander had Bess's hunted down and had him killed also as well. And he actually gave Darius III a actual uh, funeral uh, and buried him. So, so anyway, uh, now after that, Alexander kept basically going eastward. He would... Um, eventually uh, invade the rest of Persia in the east because, the, you know, you have the old Persian Empire that went all the way to India. And so uh, his forces uh, started, uh, they first took over Afghanistan and Gan uh, he didn't really have much trouble in Afghanistan. Uh, I think some of the people there tried to fight guerrilla warfare or whatever against them like they do now. But he, they, they just weren't a match for Alexander. There was a weird story where um, some um, local rebels or they, actually they were thieves, actually. They stole Alexander's horse, Bucephalus. And Alexander threatened to basically lay waste the whole land. They didn't give back his horse. And guess what? They gave him back. <laughs> they brought the horse back. <laughs> Damn. They thought they were going to kill the two thieves. I think it took it. Um, they Actually, he gave him a reward for bringing back the horse. So he had kind of a nice side to him, but Alexander was also a brutal conqueror. You know, as well. Uh, from there, from Afghanistan, he then marched into Pakistan, which is like northern India. Uh, and um, he reached the Hindu Kush mountains. And as you know, he, he came down through the Khyber Pass into the Indus River Valley. That's about as far as uh, Alexander got, which is like mostly northern India, Pakistan. That was called the Punjab region, which is that area where the tributaries of the Indus River begin. And uh, Alexander actually uh, is um, his other general, uh, not a general, a king that brings up forces against him, uh, which is uh, a king you see named King Porus. He was a, a Raja or some type of prince or king that lived in uh, the northern part of India, and he was kind of traveling through, trying to conquer that area. And so Porus didn't like that. He wanted to stop Alexander's forces. And so it led to a battle called the Battle of the Hydaspes, which they think happened in the spring of 326. I want to say April or May is when it was. And um, this was actually one of Alexander's bloodiest battles that he had overall. I think that and Golgamela was the other bloody one. And um, it was bloody because the... Um, the um, Indian forces had war elephants that they had, believe it or not. And um, they had war elephants like this elephant right here. <laughs> Just joking. Anyway, but yeah, they had war elephants and a um, little prop there. Anyway, uh, but they had elf war elephants and they could, you know, throw spears down at you and uh, trample your troops. And of course, it frightened the horses, if you know about that. Uh, so it was a really bloody battle, but there's a story where um, 
if you know about the battle, uh, it took place around the High, da High Daspes, which is a tributary of the Indus River. Uh, but it was a actual maneuver that he's famous for, where Alexander took his force, like Porus's force was on one side of the river, he was on the other. Alexander actually crossed the river in the middle of the monsoon season, by the way, I think starting at that point, crossed the, crossed the uh, river and, and actually did a 90-degree turn with his army and tacked Porus's flank. It's pretty amazing, um, and um, anyway, um, Alexander eventually won the battle. You know, it was kind of bloody, uh, but his horse was killed. He got wounded and died afterwards. And so, yeah, Bucephalus, you know, ends up dying. And he actually built a city there. I suppose it was named after him. Uh, his horse. It was called Bucephalia. So, and they would keep Porus in that area. He actually befriended Porus afterwards, and he made Porus like a local satrap type governor of that area but that area will eventually be part of the marian empire that'll kind of form out after the after i was there died you know uh then what happened was he wanted to keep going i think there's some theory that he was going to march eastward toward the pacific ocean maybe like where china is and all that but his men didn't want to go any further so they mutinied against him they all sat down and alexander started crying because uh, uh, he hadn't at that point, no more was to conquer, the old saying. Uh, and so he was forced to turn back and go back to basic, what is Iraq, or Babylon, where he would return eventually. So what he did was he took his forces all the way down to the mouth um, of the Indus River, and he split the force up. Half his force went back by ship, and then Alexander took the other half of his force back to um, Iraq. And actually, he lost more men on the way back in all the battles combined, because uh, they, they died of like dehydration, disease, lack of food or whatever. Um, and so um, he actually returned with only a third of his men left, I think, when he came back. So he returned eventually around 324 about BC. And I think he was planning to do some other expeditions after that, but as you know, he died uh, right afterwards. And he died, they say, think, sometime in June of 323. Uh, they believe falling ill at that point. And uh, there's been a lot of speculation of what killed Alexander the Great. Um, there's two main theories. Uh, one, the illness could have been like a malaria type thing, uh, where it was, you know, from mosquito bites. Uh, and then the other thing, of course, is that he may have been poisoned. And that's been very popular uh, as well. It took him like 10 years, to, I think 10 too, it took him like 10 days to like die or something like that. He went in and out of comas or, and all that. His men kept coming to him, telling him, hey, what do you want to do with the, your empire, you know? Um, and he kept telling them, get you go to the strongest. Well, that really helps us, <laughs> you know. So he was only 32 uh, when he died. So he was really young, one of the youngest conquerors of all time. And I don't know what would happen if he would have lived. Uh, history may have been different. Uh, now, what happened after his death? Well, his empire was then carved up by his generals. Uh, they started fighting over it. Uh, he did have a son, Alexander IV, but he hadn't been born yet. Uh, his wife, Roxana, was pregnant with him. But they didn't know it was going to be a boy or girl. He had no idea. They were later killed, though. Like the generals later killed both of them. You know about that. They also killed Olympias. They killed her, too, because she had still lived at that point, too, as well. And uh, eventually the generals started fighting over it, and it led to a series of wars. They were called the uh, Wars of the Diadachi, or also called the Successor Wars. And these were a series of wars where the generals fought to decide what to do with the empire. And to, well, some of them wanted to break it up, and then some wanted to keep it together. Um, and so they couldn't decide on what to do. And so it became like almost like a civil war between his generals to decide what to do. And eventually they started carving it up, and they eventually broke it up into various... Um, states that were called different names. I think some people call them the Hellenistic states. Some people call them kingdoms. And these are kind of like these Greek, Persian type states that kind of form afterwards from Hellenistic influences uh, later. I'll go through some of the generals real quick that were famous. Uh, the most famous was Ptolemy, King, uh, later called King Ptolemy the First. He was actually called Ptolemy Soter, and he was one of Alexander's generals. He actually took over Egypt and part of Libya, and he formed his own state. It was called the Ptolemaic Kingdom. It was, of course, known for the dynasty that reigned over it. 
one of the last dynasties of Egypt. And it would reign until Roman times. And Ptolemy's the one that stole Alexander's body. Yeah, he did. Took his body. He brought it back to Alexandria. And he eventually buried him there. Although they're not sure where his body is. And they've been hunting for it for years, archaeologists. And actually, about Roman times, they still knew about it. But apparently, by medieval times, nobody knows what happened to it. So it's kind of a big mystery about what happened to his tomb. Uh, there's another one named, another general named Antigonus Cyclops, or Antigonus the One-Eyed, they called him. He found the Antigone Kingdom, I guess it was called, which was also a dynasty. And it um, mostly ruled over Turkey and part of Thrace. And um, Antigonus Cyclops was one of the very few generals that wanted to keep the empire together. And um, he fought to try to keep it together, but the other generals didn't want that. His state eventually collapsed, and it collapsed after the Battle of Ipsus, uh, where he act, he got defeated. He was actually killed in the battle, and so that didn't come to fruition, and so the whole empire would definitely break up. Uh, they also had Seleucus, another general of Alexander. He would seize control of mostly uh, Iran, Iraq, those areas. He would form his own empire and dynasty that they named after him called the Seleucid Empire. He was a king, too, called Seleucus I. Uh, then, of course, Macedonia broke away. It formed its own separate state, the Kingdom of Macedonia. It would be around till Roman times, too. Uh, there were different generals that did that. Antipater was one of the main ones, and he had a son named Cassander. And they're the ones that kind of separated the state uh, and continued the kind of like the whole state that Alexander had ruled before. Uh, then one more thing about Alexander's conquest. It started a new period called the Hellenistic Age. It went from 323 to 30 BC. It was a period where uh, Greek culture was infused with Eastern cultures in the Near East. And that was due to the fact that uh, Alexander's conquest had brought in all the Greek culture that had been in Greece, uh, whether it be democracy, Greek philosophy, architecture, poetry, you know, plays, religion, whatever that the Greek world had was brought to, uh, of course, the Near East. A lot of that was fused together uh, with other cultures that were already there, like Egyptian culture, uh, Persian culture, culture of Mesopotamia, you know, and so on, Jewish culture, you know, and so everything became Hellenized, I guess you could say, uh, in the East. And, um, Alexander became this Alexandria, which Alexander had found a member, uh, became the center of his culture overall. When the Romans came and conquered the eastern part of that area, where all these kingdoms were, states, uh, they became Hellenized too. So they kind of became part of that whole, whole time period. Yeah, I like that quote I put in there about, about the Roman poet Horace. He said it best that Greece was would take her captives captive, Hellenizing more barbarians. So it helped to kind of, you know, civilize people, you know, so to speak, and but make them more like, you know, the Greeks were. So that's what the whole Hellenistic period is. It's kind of a short period, you know, because, you know, Alexander, you know, died so young. Uh, maybe if Alexander would have lived, things would have been different. Uh, but more or less the Romans will conquer most of these areas that, Alexander and the Macedonians had created states out of one of the last ones, the Ptolemaic one that fell to, you know, Octavian, which we'll get get to later, part of the Romans and all that. Uh, so usually about 30 BC is when it usually ends. So that pretty much ends this period on the Macedonian and Hellenistic age. That ends this podcast.